Okay. So, uh, obviously, all of you have noticed that there's a huge shift in the industry going from products to services. And we've been through that shift ourselves, and I'll, I'll be sharing that, kind of our lessons learned and, and our experiences. Uh, so, yes, huge shift, right? So, basically, in just in 2011, only 13% of enterprises were using any software as a service, right? And that, that was six years ago, right? So, not, not, not that find the past. And obviously that whole industry of software as a service has been growing tremendously. Uh, so 18% uh, compound annual growth uh, year to year, right? So we are at the point when it now became a norm, right? In the software industry and in, in the industry in general, right? I mean, you can now, instead of buying a Boeing airplane, you can have an airplane as a service, right? And pay Boeing for the hours you fly that airplane and all the services that they bundle with the actual airplane, with the maintenance. Um, and uh, same thing has been happening, in, obviously, in investments in SaaS. Uh, so the, the real investment, and that's just for the Silicon Valley, the real investment started in uh, 1999. Anyone knows what happened in 1999? Salesforce. Exactly. Thanks, uh, Paul. You can grab a Fries out there in the, in the hole. Yeah, so that, that's salesforce.com, <laughs> right? And, and since then, it's been growing tremendously. And then, uh, actually, at the end, uh, during the Q&A session, if someone... Well, enough to... Happen. predictable revenue, right? So they, they want to be able to have, like services model is nice, eh? it's, it, that's not me. <laughs> Obviously, uh, they want faster feedback, right? They want to actually avoid shelfware, right? I've been uh, in the software industry for a long time uh, when we used to just deliver products, uh, when I uh, worked for uh, Dell, uh, Quest software, which then began Dell software. A lot of when you sell enterprise software, there's the whole shelfware issue. You sell something, people sign the license, and then they, they don't use it, and you have to care, like, how, how do you make them actually use that and know whether they use it or not, etc. Uh, and and the, you get also less visibility into what's actually happening, right? How customers are using that, which features they're using. And, and so there's that whole broken cycle. And then uh, customers benefit from, uh, from uh, services as well, right? And that's basically, I guess, that's, that's the bigger reason why the whole services approach took off is that uh, it's actually better for the, for the customers, as you all know that, right? People don't have to pay upfront. They pay for what they use. Uh, they uh, get advantage of typically less time they have to spend on getting things running. Like in our experience, we had... Uh, customers with extremely aggressive time to market, like uh, Transport for London here, because they're using our cloud services, they can get more and more products, more and more of, of their services onboarded really quickly, and so their time to market is in weeks and not, not years. However, uh, and in this session I'll, I'll talk about all the different things uh, that you have to think about when you're going from the product to the service model, because that sort of touches everything that you have in your company. And I'll, I'll, again, I'll talk about how it touched WSO2 internally, uh, and for your organization, that might be different depending on the business you're in, but hopefully, again, these lessons will be useful. Uh, so research and development, uh, it's, uh, so you just heard Dakshita's uh, session uh, about uh, continuous segregation, continuous delivery, that kind of iterative approach. Uh, but you should understand that like, cloud is one of the reasons why companies get into that, right? Because if you have just a product that you ship once a year, even if you, have, you are trying to be agile, etc., all your team knows that their delivery date is, whatever, May 31st, 2018, right? They, they know that date 
where they have to, to do RTM, and then they work towards that date. So they, they're working on that waterfall model. Once you go down into the cloud, well, it's a different set of expectations, right? You want to actually keep your cloud service evolving. If you have an issue there in the cloud affecting all of your customers, you want developers to actually pay attention and, and fix that. Or if you have someone demanding new feature, new functionality, you want that in the cloud faster than a year from now. So that, that affects, that affects your, the way your development organization works. Obviously, there's no more uh, it works on my computer thing because it's a it's a shared development, right? So you have to change the way that developers think. They don't think about just writing the code and shipping it. They have to think more about how customers use their code. They have to understand that it's a it's a running production environment and their issues affect everyone and they need to pay attention and instrument their code and be able to troubleshoot and figure out and so on. Operations is the whole new thing, right? So uh, we at WSO2, obviously, before we launched our cloud services three years ago, we had our internal uh, internal IT, but they, they've been just serving us and our own infrastructure. So we basically had to form a team that is now running our public cloud and our uh, managed cloud. And again, Chamith from that team tomorrow will talk more about uh, how the team is operating. But it, it's a whole new team with a whole new culture that we had to form, and we had to train people, we had to learn the best practices from the industry. And uh, it's, it's a different mentality. So uh, despite the whole talk of DevOps, like developers and uh, uh, and uh, operations people just merge in and become that like a single uh, human being. In reality, these are slightly different cultures, right? So you, you have to specialize. You have to have people who are with, with that kind of mentality. And they have to be very process oriented, right? So we had to establish the whole processes of what happens if you have an outage, which outages are preventable, what you handle automatically, what you handle manually, how you have uh, 24 by 7 pages and then develop and ops people on shifts and how you do postmortems and how you notify all your customers of any maintenance or any issues and so on. And talking about that, you have to be real transparent, right? So you don't, you don't want to uh, have some sort of uh, degradation of service that's affecting hundreds of your customers and then hundreds of your customers are uh, just trying to figure out whether it's them or it's the platform that's down. And so we had to establish the whole processes and dashboards and everything. So for our public cloud, you actually you can go to uh, uptime.cloud.wc.com and see the real-time status and historical data for all our uh, public cloud services, right? So you can uh, see how, how well we've been doing recently, not just the, the current state, and also I think it's last three months. And again, be very proactive on communications. Uh, give credits, right? I mean, if, if you are down, if you don't meet your SLA, it's better to give credit to your customers. Uh, you would lose some money, but you would keep the, the goodwill, which is way more important. Security, so, uh, so that's, um, I think, uh, ZDNet uh, is doing, a, every year they're doing a survey on the most important factors in choosing the, the cloud. Uh, and security keeps keeps being number one, and it's actually even growing. So that's 2015 to 2016. Uh, so that that's keep, keeps growing as number one concern. Um, so again, not something that we really had to do in the product era. I mean, we had our code scans, and that, that was, I think that was basically it, just do the code scans and implement best practices. Now we have a very long security document uh, that we have internally. We share that with, with customers and prospects on demand. We do audits, we have very documented processes. Uh, we are very concerned on encryption, uh, so we do encryption of both data at rest and data in transit, so that, that all is very important. The tricky part about security is, again, it's a new discipline that we had to learn because security is not one thing. Security spawns everything, right? It's your infrastructure, it's your code, it's your processes, it's the identities of operations people and where they store their passwords. Ideally, they don't have their passwords and they just uh, use their own identities, how you audit the processes and everything. It's a very multi-layered thing and you, you have to think about it. 
uh, marketing has to change, right? So again, if, if your cloud strategy is targeting a different segment or different user behavior, or different niche, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm running away. <laughs> uh, then, uh, yeah, I just took a picture of a creative, creative marketing. Typically, creative marketing is what you see by different pubs. Um, uh, so, if it's a different segment then, or a different behavior, then your marketing team would need to adjust on how they address it, right? You don't just expect to put things online and, and have people just find you and, and get there. Oh, and a uh, big change, obviously, is uh, in Europe, uh, GDPR, right? If, you, if you're operating in Europe and you do email marketing, that, uh, that's, that's something that will affect you uh, next year, right? That imposes uh, significant, uh, significant uh, constraints on how you use email marketing and so on. Sales, obviously, there's, uh, so there's impact on sales, there's positive impact, and then there's potential negative impact that, that you need to watch, right? The positive impact, you put something online, and you have the whole new kind of self-service model enabled, but you need to watch how that, if you already have enterprise sales uh, team like we did, how that affects that team. You need to make sure that the team is not confused, the team understands how this cloud thing and the enterprise product thing, how they work together when they sell one or the other, or they don't have to sell one versus the other, and, and so on. And you, you need to figure out how you do that to either avoid cannibalization, or maybe you want cannibalization, and how you, how you kind of operate the two things. There's definitely impact, so you need to be mindful of that. Uh, pricing. So the good thing about services is that you can experiment with pricing, right? You're more flexible. You can experiment with different models. You can do freemium. You can do trials. Uh, you can uh, uh, you can do different kind of tiers, and and you can implement the models that that work well for your customers as a service. So. Uh, if you attended Tyler's keynote this morning, Tyler was talking about that kind of uh, serverless transaction-based model to which uh, part of the world is coming, and cloud makes it, and as a service kind of model, makes it very easy for you to go into that and experiment to that. So again, you don't typically, when you go from, serv from products to services, that would affect the way that you price things. Uh, and that, that gives you more flexibility and more ability to go into that model. And that's also something that we are now, as we are moving towards hybrid world in the future, we are watching at how that would affect our pricing and our, our models for our customers. Um, same thing, not just with the sales, but with pre-sales, right? How, how you enable, uh, enable your customers, uh, your prospects, how you help them during the trial period, how you get them onboarded quickly. The faster you help people in the service mall, uh, world to start using your service, obviously the better. And uh, you need to figure out how you make sure that that works. Uh, one interesting thing is obviously once you put something online, you can start having customers from the regions to which you might have not been selling before, right? So you get huge geographic expansion as well, which is a good thing, but something that you need to keep in mind. Uh, same thing again with support. So something that we did with our support, for example, so obviously we, we had support organization. Uh, one, like a, a few things that you need to consider is that in the cloud world, obviously in the SaaS world, people are expecting to get support uh, experience integrated into the product itself, right? So there's a different expectations that your customers have. For example, we had customers who would, uh, I mean, we, we had the support button integrated into the products, but then we had customers who would click that, submit a support ticket, and then they would have the expectation that our support team would be able to just go and fix things for them because it's in the cloud. Whereas we, coming from kind of more security cautious perspective, had separation between like what our engineers could access and could not access. So we were on the more conservative side and we had a lot of customers confused about that. So we had to implement the way for customers to actually grant access to our support team to be able to say, oh, okay, I want support team to be able to see my configuration and, and fix things for me or troubleshoot things for me. Uh, so you need to be mindful of how different model changes the expectations on the, on the support for your customers. 
And also the response times and responsiveness, again, the expectations can be much different when you have people who have like a two-week trial and they really want to get something online working quickly within days. They have high expectations on how quickly they can get things running. Finance, finance is no, is no exception, right? So when you're saving, selling products, you sell a contract, there's a booking that you need to then work into your revenue, etc. With the services model, you get recurrent revenue, monthly recurrent revenue, or, every, or annual recurrent revenue that you look at. There's a different way that you look at churn, at the upsells, right? So your, your finance team and the way that you treat the business becomes different, right? You, you look at the uh, different sort of metrics, you look at different ways that you calculate the um, lifetime value for your customers and then how you look at the customer acquisition costs and, and how they work um, and so on. And uh, the biggest probably kind of the impact is the cultural impact and obviously uh, London is probably the best uh, city in the world to, to have pictures for, for that kind of slide, right? Because you have, uh, you have to be mindful that your Existing business, the enterprise business, product business would need to coexist with that new kind of services business and, and you need to figure out how to make them coexist, right? Because basically you would have, uh, initially you would have that business that's generating a lot of revenue and that business that's generating just little revenue, although growing faster and then they work on different models and your developers work differently, and your sales works differently, and everything works differently. So how do you manage that? Uh, we've seen companies like uh, Microsoft just say, well, all in, that's it, right? And, and have, like, trying to do a hard stop and hard transition quickly. And then the work, uh, there are companies who try to coexist as much as they can, uh, or maintain the new model as experimental, or even uh, just acquire companies. Like, if you look at the way that um, Oracle are doing their cloud, that they are mostly just acquiring new companies that already have uh, cloud versions of the same kind of businesses, and then they try to introduce that. But it, it needs to have, like, in order for that to succeed, I think it needs to have clear leadership support. Uh, at WSO2, uh, if you've been attending our conferences for a long time, you've seen that uh, we've started talking about cloud and cloud being strategic for, for a long time ago. Uh, you need to have clear objectives, clear ways that you set metrics, and yeah, you need to figure out how you how you make that coexist and where is, is it separate and where it is uh, part of the of the core business. Like in our case, we didn't just launch the public shared cloud, but we also had the managed private cloud that got really easily integrated into our existing sales model and existing enterprise space, and again. Uh, added the hybrid options for the customers who are using the enterprise products but want like a API gateway in the cloud or something like that. So um, lots of things that I tried to, to fit into the 20-30 uh, minute session uh, and uh, I'm happy to, to answer any questions. Okay, so if, if that was all clear, <laughs> and you guys are happy to, to take that, and uh, obviously feel free to, to find me during the uh, reception in the evening or uh, break and ask any questions. <laughs>